From the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City, this is Road to Resilience, a podcast about getting through the hard stuff. I'm John Earl. When we were doing one of the um, workshops, we got into the conversation of going back to normal. And I asked them pointedly, was normal working for you? Because we are quick to go back to normal. And I've heard that so much. And I said, was normal working for you? That was an uncomfortable question for many people because in many ways, normal wasn't working for us in the church, perhaps even in our own personal life. We were running, we were doing this, we were doing that and spinning our wheels and not necessarily being productive. Was normal working for you? My guest today is Reverend Audrey Williamson. She is the Nina M. Neely Minister of Christian Education at Mother AME Zion, a historic Black church in Harlem. Reverend Williamson has been working with Mount Sinai to bring resilience insights from the laboratory to the community. She recently helped facilitate a series of workshops aimed at helping members of her church build resilience. The workshops covered topics associated with resilience, such as facing fear, and fittingly for a church group, faith. They represent the evolution of a project we covered last year on the podcast, which involved resilience workshops for physician assistants. But to me, there's something different and special here. It's one thing to teach resilience to caregivers. It's another thing to bring it into a community that's lost so much during the COVID-19 pandemic, as Harlem and the Mother AME Zion Church have. So in my mind, this is in a way where the rubber meets the road. And I wanted to have Reverend Audrey on to find out what she's learned from collaborating with Mount Sinai's Center for Stress, Resilience, and Personal Growth. And at the end of the day, I want to find out what we can learn from her about resilience. So here is Reverend Audrey Williamson. Enjoy. First of all, thank you so much for being on Road to Resilience. Thank you for coming in to record with me. I want to start out talking about Mother AME because it's a historic church and there's so much. I just give somebody who's who's not heard of Mother AME Zion kind of a little introduction to where orient us. Where are we? Okay, so AME Zion's church started as a form of resistance and resilience. So the resistance was that the African-American was not able to worship fully at um, the Methodist church that was established. They were worshiping there, but were not able to pray openly, were not able to receive communion as they wished. So it was a space for resilience. And their resilience led them to founding the AME Zion Church in 1796. That's the resistance part. They were set up as a community, and the community was Seneca Village. Seneca Village has now become Central Park. And so that idea of resistance, but also resilience, is part of the African-American story, but certainly the story of Mother Zion in New York as the oldest Black church in all of New York. What was it like for you to be, you know, church leader over the past two years almost. So so let me just say, COVID really hit our community very hard. We lost at least 10 to 15% of our membership during this COVID time, especially in the very beginning. And that was, and they were, many of them were strong members, members, you know, that, um, were very active in the ministry that were the, tr- the the treasurer and the person who did this and the person who was responsible for that. Um, we had a large number of people that passed away, especially in the very beginning, and it was very traumatic. And we haven't gone back in person. And one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about resilience, because I think that grief is love that has no place to go. And when we get back to the church, we're going to see empty seats. And so even though we know they're gone, these people, some of them have been gone almost two years. But the idea of of visually seeing it is going to be, I think, difficult for some people. And so so preparing people to come back to a place that is going to look different and is going to feel different. We're not going to have as many visitors come through at this point, right? So it's going to look different in so many ways. And so preparing us kind of spiritually, but also emotionally and mentally um, to come back and to be a vibrant 
community is kind of my goal in terms of this road to resilience. That number that you gave, 10 to 15 percent of a congregation of two to 300 people, is unfathomable it is. to me. It is. It is. It is. And even though we know these people are gone, the idea of coming back and kind of reliving that grief that probably has not been completely addressed is going to be difficult. Grief is love with no place to go. How is grief coming out in different ways? So uh, even before COVID, if you think about how people deal with grief, most of us, because grief really hurt. I mean, if you really deal with the loss of someone that is no longer here on this earth with you, um, someone you really care about and that you really love, it hurts. It's sad. It's, it, it, it hurts way down deep in your soul. So oftentimes it comes out and manifests in other ways. So when people are grieving, they are sometimes angry. Or sometimes they will drink over it, right? Or they will eat over it. Or they will buy lots of things that they don't need over it. I have done it. I know. I have done it. When my, uh, when my dad passed away, um, I was um, a senior in college. And I was very close to my dad. And I, my behaviors were not positive as I was finishing school. You know, I started to think about, uh, you know, they weren't positive behaviors, full stop. I didn't do anything horrible, but they were not behaviors that I would have engaged in had 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 this not happened. What right? are you seeing in members of the congregation? Uh, in members of the congregation, I'm seeing um, a com- perhaps sometimes a combativeness. I'm seeing the concern of kind of being of isolation. Um, and that what that isolation looks like. I'm also seeing a bit of, well, well, let me say it this way. I'm not sure even as well, because when you do pastoral care in person, you can identify some of the behaviors that are not appropriate. When you're, fr- when you're doing it from a distance, you can't always tell. So the idea that we're on Zoom and it's, it's a lot more work to do something on Zoom, right? Because you have to not just hear the words of somebody, but you also have to understand the underlying meanings. So it takes a lot more emotional energy to, to understand what's being said and what's happening over Zoom as opposed to being in person. Mm. So let's get into these workshops. What was your hope for them? So my hope was that we begin to talk about some of the issues that are concerning us. I had a former pastor who would say, you can't fix it unless you face it. And so trying to face some of the issues that we haven't talked about, maybe we've talked about them in small pods or small groups, but really being able to come and say, yes, I need to face my fears. Yes, I have lost some hope. Um, So really being able to talk about it, but talk about it from a spiritual place. And that's why I'm so grateful for Mount Sinai, because, you know, we're not just spiritual people. We have, um, you know, mind, body and soul. And so not just from a spiritual place, but from a rational, clinical place to talk about some of what we're going through and to make us understand that we're not the only ones feeling this way or going through this or feeling isolated or thinking about how the next, you know, when does this end? How does this end? And thinking about the next several months and how do I get back to what I was doing without going back to everything that I was doing that kind of made me crazy that I found out I didn't have to do necessarily, right? So trying to figure out what new normal looks like and being healthier and being more in control. Um, but we need to talk about it. We need to think about it. And Oftentimes, if someone doesn't bring it up, then you, you know, you just, it's kind of in the, in the recesses of your mind. You haven't, you don't think about it, you don't talk about it, and you just, mm. you know, it's just there, kind so you, of Yeah, swirling. so the workshops were kind of a structure for addressing this thing that we've been talking about. Um, and so there were six, I think, and six. each one had mm-hmm. a different theme. And mm-hmm. it was, you know, I was fortunate enough to sit in on one. Um, it was a beautiful experience. And 
um, basically you're imagining, you know, 10, 15 people sitting in a Zoom room talking about issues like facing fears and hope and faith. And um, the one that you brought up, fear, facing fears, is an interesting one for me. Um, it's not the first one that I would think of in this context. So what were the fears that people were facing? And then what did what were some of the tools that were introduced during the workshop? So again, the first it was face your fears. So first you have to face them. And so how we started that one, I, 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 that was probably one of my favorites. How we started that was just to talk about what you fear. So what were the fears that some of them that came up during the conversation? Um, so I told, well, let me say it like this. I told them one of the greatest fears is speaking in glossophobia, right? Speaking in front of an, a, a crowd or an audience and everyone kind of agreed. Um, but then we kind of can roll into this idea of the fear of the loss of someone and how I'm going to keep going even though that person is gone. The fear of, right, of loss, of loss of of whatever, of loss of employment, of loss of a community, all of those fears. Well, let's focus on that one because I think that one's particularly relevant to COVID, mm -hmm. fear of loss. Mm -hmm. You know, this is still a specter that hangs over us. So where do you begin to address that fear? What do you do with that, right? You, and, and I think that's the beauty of these workshops is we don't have all the answers, but let's have this conversation. What does that look like? How does that, how does it feel? We've lost people already. How have we managed? What will we do as we move forward? Um, what are the options? What's the worst that, and I, I said this to someone and they said they are guided by this. What's the worst that can happen? So sometimes you have to start there and say, okay, some of my fears are really large and the problem is not quite as horrible as I think. But losing people is really difficult. And so we need to acknowledge that some of those fears are valid because sometimes people just need to, to hear that what you're thinking, you're not crazy. You're not alone. And because I can't, you know, none of us have control over from Delta to Omicron to any wherever else. We're, we're going to learn the whole Greek. We're gonna we're gonna learn it. We're gonna, learn we're gonna be it. speaking we're gonna Greek by the end of there this. There and Omega, we're gonna Omega, and Alpha to the Omega, huh? <laughs> and so, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. But let's face it. Let's talk about it. And that's the beauty of the the workshops is the place to talk about it. To place to talk about it and to to acknowledge that you're not alone either in your thinking, but also you. We still have a community. We're still here, and. It's nice for us to talk about it from a spiritual standpoint, but it's it's really important that we also had a clinical, um, some clinical input to help us understand what our brain is doing. And I think that's one of the things that we have to be very um, intentional about is explaining to people what's happening, how it's happening and making sense of it. So it's not it's both. It's not either or it's, it's both and it's mm. spiritual, but mm. rational. How would you begin to talk about how those two work together? Or let's speak concretely about the workshops. How did they complement each other? So the genius, I think, of the workshop was we started from a spiritual place. So they wanted you to, of course, do your prayer, and they had a scripture, right? And um, so we start from that, from that place. We start from a spiritual place, which um, for the church, that's a good place to start. So that's a good, that's a good in. So starting there and then having this piece where we talked about how your brain works when you're uh, dealing with fear. And, and we didn't go that far into it, but really thinking about it from a clinical standpoint so that now I'm using another side of your brain. I'm using another way for you to think about it. So it doesn't just have to be, you know, scripture and Jesus, but it can also be a rational way to think about. And if you do it that way, then you can be transformational in the ways in which you face your fears, the ways in which you think about the work of the church. Is there a piece of scripture that comes to mind right now that's been useful for you during the pandemic? 
So I have um, a scripture that I, um, and, and it's not even just a, uh, a, a one verse, but it's a story, and it's the story of Job. And I don't, I don't know if many of your listeners know the story of Job, but Job was wealthy and then was al- allowed, everything was allowed to be taken away from him. And he was a really faithful man, very faithful. And, you know, the story goes that the enemy says that he, um, he's only faithful because you, God, you, God, you bless him. And so he, God begins to allow the hedge of protection to come from him. So he takes money, children, touches his body. And so finally, Job, long story short, Job begins to question, this faithful man begins to question God. And God who lo- who who trusted Job enough to test him, says to him finally, where were you when I built the foundations of the earth? And do you even have understanding of it? And so I think that that's, that's where I stand, is that my faith says that I serve a God who created the mountains, who set the oceans in place. And so I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to learn what I need to learn. I need to, I'm going to work as it's day before night comes and no man, no woman can work. I'm going to do all of that, but I'm also going to trust God who's, who created the foundations of the earth. And I don't even have an understanding of it. And so I take that text and I juxtapose it and put it alongside a scripture in Psalm that says, what is man? What is woman that it, God is even mindful of us. And so when I put those together, the same God that created the moon and the stars who when we go out in the autumn time in the autumnal beauty and we see the the paintings of God when the trees begin to change and flower but then they fall off and they die. That's the same God who is mindful of me and you. And so if I can put those together and remind, remind myself that I serve an awesome powerful all-knowing, all-creating God, but that that same God is still mindful of me. I think it gives me hope and it gives me a sense of, I don't have to do it all by myself. I don't, I don't have to do it all by myself. God is counting on me as though God is not working, but God is working though he doesn't have to count on, or she doesn't have to count on anybody. And that gives me peace. And I imagine those are stories that resonated with the people sitting in that Zoom room. Right, because sometimes because we don't, we have found out in this season that we, I mean, we can control a lot of things, but there are some things we simply don't have control over. And when we start to to understand that, and to, and so oftentimes in church and as pastors and as ministers, we have what some people refer to as a God complex. So we think we've got to do everything and be everything and and. And, you know, the doors don't open without us. And we have to also remind ourselves that that's, that's not holy. That's just thinking that you can do everything and be everything. That's not holy. Holiness is, is also knowing that God is a God who will come to see about you and who wants you to have rest and peace. We've heard so much in the past 22 months about people and self-care and all of that. And... Uh, you know, self-care, okay, but the idea that sometimes we just appreciate where we are and understand we can't change it and figure out in this season, what are we supposed to be doing? How are we supposed to be moving forward? How are we supposed to be God's hands and feet and mouth in this season, even if, if we're on Zoom, even if we can't meet in person? How are we supposed to be um, the handiwork of God, as it were, right now in this season, as opposed to rushing through and trying to get out of it. And and you notice as we try to rush through, we keep getting setbacks because maybe we just haven't learned the lessons yet. So we've got to get to a place where we decide to learn the lessons so that we can come out and flourish and be that our resilience is, is full and lasting. Because resilience doesn't always have to, it is not always lasting, right? We can, we can be resilient and then we come back and we have to face the same issues again. If we haven't learned the lessons, then we have to go through the process all over again. But if we've learned some of the lessons, then we can remind ourselves of what we did last time, how we did last time. And we can 
we could be a little bit more, we can find equilibrium as opposed to the, the roller coasters that we often find. Mm. We can find equilibrium. Yeah, it strikes me that the one of the challenges of this moment being the grind phase, kind of the long, slow grind. And I'm wondering what that, to you, calls for. I think that um, really sitting down and getting a sense of purpose and a sense of what's next for you and not rushing back to what used to be when we were doing uh, one of the... Um, workshops. And I don't remember which one it was, but we got into the conversation of going back to normal. And I asked them pointedly, was normal working for you? Because we are quick to go back to normal. And I've heard that so much. And I said, was normal working for you? And most of them, that was an uncomfortable question for many people because in many ways, normal wasn't working for us in the church, perhaps even in our own personal life. We were running, we were doing this, we were doing that and spinning our wheels and not necessarily being productive. Was normal working for you? So what does your new normal work? I mean, in these 22 months, what have you found is profitable? What do you want to keep? What do you want to keep? What's your passion? Where are you being called to be of greater impact? Where are you being called to step away? Everything that you were doing doesn't have to go back. It doesn't have to go back because if you are honest with yourself, many for many of us, normal was not working. We were running back and forth, doing nine to fives, trying to catch trains, me running, trying to catch trains, screaming at the platform saying, hold the train. And today, as I came into New York, I ran up the stairs and the train was just coming in. And I said, if that train leaves, I am not doing it. And so, and so I, I'm, not, I'm not screaming for hold the train again. And I say that um, to remind us that it's easy to go back to what we've done um, because it feels comfortable as opposed to really going deep into our recesses and seeing what we're supposed to be do, supposed to do and to leave some of that behind, leave some of that in 2019. What about all that grief that people are carrying? What are your thoughts on unburdening or processing or however you want to call it? This is also going to be a bit of a statement of privilege, and I, I, and I acknowledge it, so I, I want to say this. But please get find someone, whether it's someone you could just talk to or it's a professional, because at least try to unpack the grief that has that's in throughout this society, right? That there's, that's throughout your life. At least try to unpack it, because if not, your relationships will suffer, your health will suffer, you um, will be just cut, bandaging up um, a, an issue that is surgical. Um, and so find help wherever you can find it, whether it's a professional, uh, and there's no shame. I tell people all the time, you need a pastor and a therapist. Um, and sometimes your therapist, if you can't find a therapist where that you, you know, are able to go to, then sometimes the therapist is just the grandmother down the street who really does have time and has lived through some of this. And she didn't, maybe she didn't go, she didn't, she didn't have a PhD, but she understands how li- the rhythms of life. So who, how, however and whomever you can talk to, um, that's not just spiritual because we, we're we more than a spiritual being. So to find some way, somehow to talk it out and to unpack the sadness, the deep sadness that you feel when you lose somebody. And sometimes you just need someone to listen. And maybe if you're on the other side and you aren't grieving, maybe you can be that listener. Maybe you can be the person that just doesn't butt in and cut in and, you know, try to pray them through it. Just listen. Just listen. And just hear, not just listen, but just and hear what they're saying. And sometimes people will, in the midst of their grief, will tell you what they need. Um, and it may not, it may not be, um, you know, another sermon. 
it may be something completely different. So to to be a good listener as well, I think, helps. And I think when you help others, it helps your grief, when you start to turn your attention. So when we turn our attention from ourselves, from our inner selves, and begin to think of others and to and begin to figure out ways to be um, helpful, a blessing, um, a confidant, a listener for others, it often helps us our grief. And I don't know how that works. I, there may be a scientific uh, kind of... Um, but I do know that when you focus less on yourself um, and begin to, to work with other people who are having a difficult time, it lessens your grief as well. Reverend Audrey Williamson is the Nina M. Neely Minister of Christian Education at the Mother AME Zion Church in Harlem. That's all for this episode of Road to Resilience. A special thanks to the team at Mount Sinai Center for Stress, Resilience, and Personal Growth, which developed the workshops and made this episode possible. This interview was recorded earlier this month at the Levy Library at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. From all of us here, thanks for listening. Have a happy new year, and we'll see you in 2022.